Hello, my name is Terry Kylo, and this is my story of the practice of authentic allyship. I was born in 1964 in the town of La Crosse, Washington, a town of 300 people known for winter wheat and high school basketball. The 1960s were a challenging time for my family. My father had dropped out of school to work on the farm. He was without a job and a career once my grandfather sold the farm without much notice. Mom and Dad bought the second grocery store in town, only to lose their tenuous business after a fire. Bankruptcy was an unforgettable, unpardonable crime in my small town. And my dad took a custodial job at the school. And then very quickly, my mother was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Not only had we lost a farm, but we had lost our place, our status, and many of our family friends distanced themselves from us. I'm not sure if they were more afraid of catching MS or joining us in our now lowly status. Two experiences stand out for me. I remember farmers catcalling my dad as he swept the floor during halftime of the games. Come on, Bruce, they would shout. The once proud farmer now sweeping the floor for the farmer's kids, for the sport of the farmers. They appeared to be joking, of course, but that was only a cover for the mockery that was a dagger in my soul. I could see my dad stealing himself so that his body would not betray his pain. I remember standing in the doorway to the Lutheran Church sanctuary as a member of the church and a cousin told me, your mother would not be sick if your family were better Christians. Her theory, apparently, was that God was behind our difficult decade, standing in judgment over us, punishing us for our own good. This was when I started my intense interest in the study of theology, because it just didn't seem right to me. But it still hurt. But I knew that once I left lacrosse, I would be a six foot three inch white male. I knew that once I left lacrosse, no one would know of my family's loss of status. When I went to seminary in Chicago to prepare for service as a pastor in the Lutheran Church, I learned of the role of many Lutherans and the role they played in the Holocaust. Some actively fought for their Jewish neighbors and resisted the Nazi party, but most went right along with the Nazis, actively supporting, just doing their job, living in denial. And some church leaders gave their public blessing to Hitler. In the cafeteria, many of us swore an oath that we would not be silent if we saw something similar happen in our own time. We would learn from our tradition's failures and act as Dietrich Bonhoeffer and others did, as authentic allies. In early 2015, I was invited to come to a small military town with a Muslim friend of mine. That night, I saw hate and fear mixed with curiosity, all focused on my Muslim friend. As we held four more of these sessions around the Salish Sea in western Washington state, I experienced something even more disturbing. Everywhere we went, we got the same questions, phrased in the same way, in almost the same order. Everywhere. The crowds were different, but the hate and fear were the same. Then I learned that this was not an accident. Since 2008, well-funded hate groups have been doing messaging studies and spending millions of dollars per year to dehumanize our Muslim neighbors. Dehumanization, you see, is not just about words, but words that lead to sticks and stones. Since this realization, I've resigned from parish ministry and engaged in over 300 speaking engagements. I helped to create a training program for faith leaders to counter anti-Muslim bigotry. I worked with my partner, Anila, to create an animated video series and social media campaign. Mostly, I have used my status as a white male Christian pastor to create space for Muslim voices. Some can hear me, 
when they can't hear my Muslim neighbors, even when we're saying the same thing. Many Muslims recognize me as an ally, and I have risked a lot to participate in this cause. I've lost money, some status, and even some of my personal safety. When I told my home church what I was doing, many could not look at me. I've lost sleep at night when I realized that something I said at a public event came from the anti-Muslim bigotry that is so pervasive in our nation, in my own tradition, and that still has a place in me. The reality is, though, that the pledge we made to each other in the cafeteria at seminary, as good as it was, denied a lot of what was happening in our nation, within plain view, if we would perceive it. For 400 years, our indigenous neighbors have been murdered, forced to live on small remains of their once vast land. For 400 years, black people have been enslaved or declared as less than human in a system designed to extract their labor to benefit others. Migrant farm workers have lived without full rights and living only three-fifths the lifespan of white people in the United States. Those in the LGBTQ community have been denied their right to live and love and build lives as themselves. Our nation's constitutional, aspirational values never fully abandoned, but secondary to greed and fear of losing status and denial of the present and past. Many Muslims recognize me as an ally. And I am proud to stand with them, to support them in their work for their human and civil rights and the human and civil rights of others. But I was born into a culture of status, and being born into it could hardly see it. The farmland my great-grandfather got for free, for being Christian, white, and willing to farm it, was taken from the polis peoples and what is now Eastern Washington State. After church, racial slurs were a common occurrence in the parking lot. When you have benefited from the oppression of a people, you see, you can't live with yourself unless you dehumanize them. Once you dehumanize one group, the dehumanization of the next comes all too easily. I did experience some of the downsides of the caste system in my youth. I felt the searing pain of being relegated to the bottom of the pile because of the bankruptcy my family experienced and my mother's chronic illness. But I knew this was a localized situation. I knew that outside La Crosse and its microclimate that I would have no end of opportunities to walk in the sunshine. I knew, but in some ways didn't know. Martin Luther King Jr. taught that we are not responsible for the culture we're born into, only for what we do to realize the truth about it and what we can do to make it better. We're responsible for what we can do to bend the moral arc of the universe toward justice. As Elie Wiesel said, wherever men and women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. This leaves some important questions for those of us who were born pretty high on the pyramid of status, pretty high in the caste system. Of course, we were born there without our permission or our accomplishment. These questions include, will we notice the pyramid? Will we work to dismantle the caste system? Will we use our status to do away with the whole idea of status? What risks are we willing to take to bend the moral arc of our part of the universe? Are we willing to make those persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views the center of our universe and not make it about us? What do we value so much? that we're willing to change ourselves and work for a more just, equitable, and peaceful world. 
These are among the questions we must ask as we seek to practice authentic allyship. My experience of my family's loss of status gave me the gift of a beginning of compassion for my indigenous, black, LGBTQ, and many other neighbors, and for minority religious traditions as well. But only a beginning of compassion. During many of my speaking events, I have felt some portion of the fear and hate directed toward our Muslim neighbors, but when the event is done, I can once again reclaim my status. My Muslim neighbors can't at least until enough of us realize that we don't have to live this way anymore. The question for all of us really is this. Do we want to live this way? Do we want our neighbors to live this way? For a while, I practiced authentic allyship because I knew our nation and my own tradition had fallen short of our stated values. But now it's different. Now I practice authentic allyship because I've gotten to know Muhammad and Nasreen, Jeff, Anila, Adam, Karen, Jamal, and so many others. Recognizing their humanity is a part of my own humanity. Working for a world without status, for the beloved community we all long for and our children deserve, has become an expression of my humanity and our common humanity. It is an act of love we engage in together. I have not learned everything about the practice of authentic allyship. I have much to learn. I invite you to learn with me.